<laughs> things here. Okay, we'll make a start. We'll have a word of prayer. And our topic tonight is, is the conscience. We're going to have a look at the conscience and see some of the implications of that. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. We thank you again, Lord, for this amazing revelation that you've put into our hands. We thank you for the word of God. And we thank you that you have given to us the author so that we may understand it in the spirit in which it was written. And we pray, Lord, tonight as we gather together that you will open our hearts and open our understanding and open your word to us and make this a time of blessing and profit, Lord, to each one of us. Amen. All right, so we'll, we'll follow the same pattern as we've done the other time. That's to say we'll have three separate sessions. Um, and we're going to deal with the conscience. And to begin with, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, just the nature of man, the, the way that man has been created and this amazing faculty that God has given to us called the conscience. And we'll, we'll look at the way it functions and some of the ways in which at times it misfunctions or malfunctions. Um, so we'll look at that. Maybe you know that um, people who study the Bible, um, Christians, evangelical Christians, divide into kind of two groups concerning the nature of man. They're what they call the bipartite people who believe that man is body and soul and that spirit is just another way of saying soul. And then you have another group who are what they call tripartite and they believe that there are three separate sections that you can identify, that's to say body, soul and spirit. And in, in some ways, even using words like parts, I think kind of get us off on the wrong foot. Because human beings are just human beings and, and God has made us whole. And every part of us, every function that's within us affects every other function with us. So I'm not going to try and get, I'm, I'm going to avoid the temptation to get too technical and too precise in sort of trying to divide between body, spirit, soul, this kind of thing. In the letter to the Hebrews, <clears throat> It tells us that the Word of God is unique, it's, it's sharp, it's living, it's like a two-edged sword, and it says it has the power, the ability, to do three things in particular. And it's, um, it's, it's kind of interesting, the three things it gives. And it gives these three things, which are obviously things which are very difficult to divide by any other means other than by the Word of God giving us insight. In other words, it's only by revelation that we can make certain distinctions. If we're talking about body, soul, and spirit, we may be able to kind of give certain definitions of certain things. But actually, to divide between body, soul, and spirit is really, can be really quite dangerous. And it can lend itself to people who are very judgmental to kind of describe everyone who has a different opinion to theirs as being soulish. Um, and everyone else is kind of soulish, but I am spiritual kind of a thing. And, and uh, this verse in Hebrews is key because it says that the Word of God is able to dis d distinguish between things like joints and marrow. And if you think about it, marrow is sort of within the joints. Marrow is within the bones that make up the joints. So I'm not going to be too technical. It's going to be about a medical student in our midst, so I don't want to get myself into too much trouble. Um, but it's, in one sense, from the outside, it's quite impossible to distinguish between uh, these things because one is hidden, usually, um, until the person's dead. And that's kind of one of the problems that we have very often with certain aspects of Bible teaching, that um, there are some things you can only examine properly when they're dead. And the trouble is that when they're dead, they don't work in the way that they're supposed to work. And people can take things to pieces and they understand them perfectly, but then they don't work anymore. That's the problem with them. So you've got things like bones, uh, joints and marrow. And then you've got this other thing which speaks of 
soul and spirit. So it obviously is possible to distinguish between soul and spirit. But there aren't any rules of thumb that you can use to do it. There aren't any kind of manuals you can write. Uh, and I am really quite strongly against most of the manuals that have been written on this particular topic. I'm very uncomfortable with Wetchman Nee, with his spiritual man and the latent power of the soul. And I'm even more uh, uh, uncomfortable with the lady he got it from. Um, this is Jesse Penn Lewis. Um, there are certain kind of patterns that they have of dividing things up which I think are 95% speculation. They're not biblical revelation. They're just people devising things and saying, well, I think it works like this. So I'm, I'm not going to get into that territory at all. Uh, but we are going to talk a little bit about the way that man is. So um, what is man and how is he different to the animals? Well, some people say, well, one of the differences is that man <coughs> has a spirit and animals don't have a spirit. But if you look very carefully at the Bible, you discover that the word that's used for spirit of men is sometimes referred to as being spirit in animals as well. So you get some people say, well, oh no, animals don't have a soul, but human beings have a soul. But again, if you look carefully at the words, you discover that sometimes the word is used of animals having a soul and people having a soul. So it, 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 isn't, it isn't just a kind of a crude difference. There's actually a difference in the kind of spirit that a man has that makes human beings uniquely human. It's, um, if we have a quick look at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And we're definitely not going to try and create a kind of a, a manual how to do this or how to do the other. This is Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became, the New King James Version says, a living being. The actual word is soul. He became a living soul. So you've got certain things here. You've got God beginning this process by forming something and the verbs that are used are actually the verb for a potter. So God forms man. He shapes him. And then as part of this process, or is it a part, a point where you can actually say something different happened, God breathed into this creature that he had formed with his hands, the spirit of life. And this thing became a living being. He became, he became a being who was uniquely activated by the dynamic of a human spirit. I hope that isn't kind of too complicated a thing to say right at the beginning. The thing that makes human beings human is that they have a human spirit because God makes them completely different to anything else. If you kind of just look at the outside of things, you could say, well, roughly speaking, a man has the same skeletal structure as an ape. But he's not an ape. He has the same kind of skin, roughly, as a pig, but he's not a pig. And it's, it's not in the physical that he is distinguished as a human being. Dennis Clark, you remember the old preacher, used to say that when God was creating man, he used to say, we'll, we'll give him the bones of a monkey and the skin of a pig. That'll keep him humble. Um, that was just Dennis Clark's sense of humor. He didn't mean that seriously. Um, but it's, it's, it's just the fact that in one sense, physically, uh, there is a different maybe in measure in the sophistication of how human beings are but really there's nothing different in kind. We, we were made of the dust of the earth and the animal life was made of the dust of the earth. Dogs were made of the dust of the earth. And so was the only thing that wasn't made of the dust of the earth and shaped as a potter shapes something is the woman. And the woman wasn't potted, according to the scripture. She was built. And there's a different kind of verb that's used. And I have no doubt that this is kind of part of God. Um, putting the clues in their position because he was determined to build something right from the very beginning. Um, he was going to build his church. And this whole pattern and picture of the man and the woman who was not formed but built uh, would all be part of that kind of revelation. There's a wonderful Wesley hymn in our 
blue book that um, talks about God taking um, Adam's rib and then follows through the picture and speaks of Christ's open side upon the cross. And uh, it was not a useless rib, rib he lost, is one of the, the lines in it. Let's have a look at Daniel chapter 4 and verse 16. Because I want to introduce another word, which is the word heart. Now where does heart fit in? Well, we, we have a physical heart. And in a sense, we have a heart of what you might call the soul. And you also have a kind of a heart, which is the very center of the spirit. In fact, the word heart, when it's used in the Bible, is often used to mean the very center of something. When it speaks in, uh, in the story of um, uh, Jonah, and it says that Jonah was thrown into the midst of the sea, the Hebrew actually says he was thrown into the heart of the sea, and that's to say the very center of it. I want you to look at this verse in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 16. Because it's the decree of the angel watchers. Uh, it concerns Nebuchadnezzar. He has this dream, and in this dream he sees these certain things happening. And in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 16, this is the decree of the watchers. Because of his pride and his arrogance, God is going to judge him. And this is what it says, verse 16. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast, and let seven times pass over him. And if you remember the story here, this is exactly what happens. For a, a little while, Nebuchadnezzar is humbled by this dream that he's had, but then ultimately he struts about in his palace, very proud and arrogant, and the angel watchers then uh, execute the sentence that they had threatened here at this point. And they use exactly the same, it uses exactly the same language, that he was given the heart of a beast. And from that point on, it wasn't, it wasn't the fact that his skeleton changed or his skin texture changed, <coughs> but it actually says his heart was changed and the heart of a beast was given to him and he began to behave like a beast. He began to eat grass like an ox. His hair began to grow, uh, grow like feathers and his fingers like talons. And uh, he became wild because he had received a wild heart. So when the scripture speaks about the heart, it's really talking about the, the inward essence, the dynamic of something, the thing which shapes our disposition and the way in which we behave because of the kind of spirit we have right deep down inside us. Okay. Um, so a human being has this unique, unique spirit. Now, we have a body and we have a soul and we have a spirit and my body is able to be conscious of the physical things. It's, my body is conscious of itself. It knows roughly where it is. It knows roughly how big it is. I don't often walk into things because I thought I was smaller or narrower or farther away. Um, I, I know where my body is and I know where it is in relationship to other things. So my body has a kind of a consciousness. My spirit also has a consciousness. But the purpose of my spirit was, in a sense, parallel to the purpose of my body. My body enables me to impact and be impacted by the physical world. That's how I receive things through my body. Because I am physical and I live in a world which is physical. But my spirit is able to impact and be impacted by things which are spiritual, things which are in the spiritual world. But both those impacts, whether it's of body or of spirit, will actually be registered as well in the soul. So there's, there's a constant interconnection of body, soul and spirit. Okay. Um, I was going to illustrate this with a computer, but I distrust illustrations about computers. But I'll just say this kind of simply, that if you have, if you have a computer with a touch screen, um, that touch screen 
actually does two things. It enables you to kind of put information into the computer. And it also enables you, because it's a screen, to receive information from the computer. It's a, an interface. And it's a kind of a two-way interface. Now, our body is a two-way interface. And our spirit is a two-way interface. As to say, they can both receive and manifest. So, if I am happy, it can be manifested in my body. Um, and if things happen to me, if I am cold, I will become kind of less than happy deep down in my soul because there's, it's a two-way interface. And it's important to know, I'm not going to go into details, but it's important to kind of understand that in the spirit too, the spirit is a two-way interface. As to say, my spirit can impact other spirits and my spirit can be impacted by other spirits. And the consequence of it impacting other spirits or being impacted by other spirits will be registered in my soul and maybe even in my body. We won't kind of go into too many details about that. What does the word conscience mean? I said that's what we're going to talk about. Well, the Greek word conscience really means joint knowing. It's made up of two words, one that is knowing and the other one that means together. So conscience is, it, conscience can never operate just on its own. It can't stand alone. It doesn't function um, in the way that it, 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 it's, it's like a, a self-contained world. It needs something. It needs information. It needs knowledge. And it's the reaction of something inside me to that knowledge and then judgments that are made which is what we're talking about when we talk about the conscience. It's almost as though the conscience is like, is like a, a court of law or a judgment court. Um, and there's something in me which is able to pass a verdict on certain things and to say certain things in terms of judgment. But that thing which is in me, which is my conscience, doesn't actually create the laws that it works by. The laws that it works by come from somewhere else. Um, they come, let's have a look at, Je at uh, Romans chapter 2. And we'll see here just a passage of scripture. to stick to the notes. <clears throat> Romans chapter 2 and verses 14 and 15. In chapter 1 and 2, Paul is, is talking about what has happened in the world. He's talking about the way in which humans turned their back consciously on the revelation of truth that God had given to them and the consequences of that. Because of that, God gave them over, says the Bible, to a mind which doesn't function properly, a failed mind, a reprobate mind. Um, and that led to idolatry, and idolatry led to immorality. That's the, that's the course of action according to Romans chapter 1 and 2. And uh, in Ro Romans chapter 2, he begins to speak a little bit about um, the Jewish people who had a special treasure, a special um, advantage that God had given to them. And you can actually see it if you look at chapter 3, where Paul says this, What advantage then has the Jew? Or what is the profit of circumcision? And he says this, Much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. That's to say the Jewish people, as a covenant people of God, were uniquely privileged in that God gave them very special revelation. He gave them very special revelation about the nature of God, about the nature of sin. And he entered into a unique relationship with them, which was very, it was very exacting. When, when God gives privilege to people, that also includes greater responsibility. And in Amos chapter 3 and verse 2, God says this to the people of Israel. He says, you only have I known of all the people of the earth. For that reason, 
I will punish you for all your sins. In other words, greater information, the fact that they had greater revelation, gave to them greater responsibility. And consequently, God punished them more severely than he would punish other people. But here it's speaking about their privilege that they were given the revelation which is enshrined in what we call the Scriptures. So this is their greatest glory. This is a greater glory, glory than their land, their priesthood, uh, their psalms, anything else they ever did. Their greatest glory was that to them were entrusted the oracles of God. So they had information that the conscience could work on. Because they knew how God wanted them to behave and because they had clear revelation, their conscience was able to work in a particular way. It had better data. It had better information. It had a clearer view of what the laws were. So consequently, it was designed so that it could make better judgments and met better evaluations because they'd got better information. There's an, there's an old saying in computer, kind of rubbish in and rubbish out, as to say if you put data into a computer uh, that's wrong, the chances are the answer you get out of it will be wrong as well. Actually, sometimes if you put answers in that are right, you can still get answers out that are wrong. But certainly if you put information in that's wrong, then really it's almost impossible to get right stuff out of it. Now, the, the quality of the information, the quality of the data that went into the Jewish people was greater, a better quality, than it was with the rest of mankind. Mankind had some information as well, but the quality of the information wasn't as accurate and precise as the information that God had given to the people of Israel. So let's have a look at chapter 2 and verse 14 and see how Paul expresses this. He's talking about um, them keeping the law, the Jewish people that is, and he's actually just said to them, well, it's no use you having the law if you don't keep it. It's no use you knowing all the right things if it doesn't make any difference to the way in which you live your lives. And then in verse 11 he says this, is, this is one of the great themes of Romans, there is no partiality with God. There's no respect of persons with God. Verse 12, for as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. And then you've got a parenthesis, that's something in brackets. From verse 13 down to the end of verse 15, almost certainly your Bible will have put those verses in a parenthesis brackets. Because the flow of the argument actually continues from at the end of verse 12 and then jumps to verse 16. So you could read it like this, verse 12. As many as have sinned without law will also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law, verse 16, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. That's the completion of the idea that Paul is talking about. But in the middle of that, there's this little parenthesis. And this is what he says, verse 12, verse 13. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when the Gentiles, that's to say people who didn't have the unique revelation that God had given to the Jewish people, when the Gentiles who do not have the law, by nature, do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law, not the words, notice. They have... They show the work of the law. I'll pause for a moment. What he's going to say is that Gentiles have the law, but they don't have it expressed in the precision, in the way that God gave it to the Jewish people. They don't have the words of the law. Words are very precise ways of communicating information. And God gave to the people of Israel his law in words. Um, and when they entered into the covenant, they actually entered into a covenant that had to do with these words and these judgments. as to say the covenant was dependent upon the words that God had spoken to them. And in Deuteronomy, when this thing is kind of repeated, the second giving of the law, you've got this wonderful phrase where Moses says to the people, 
The secret things belong to God. But the things that are revealed are ours forever. And what he was saying is really pretty much what Moses was saying in uh, Romans chapter 3. That this unique revelation of God's mind given to the Jewish people was a priceless treasure. It became less than their priceless treasure. It became their prison because they didn't listen to what the law was saying. And Jesus, if you remember that famous occasion in John chapter, uh, I've forgotten John 6, I think it is somewhere around there. Um, Jesus says to them, you search the scriptures because in them you think you find eternal life. And they are they that testify of me. And you won't come to me that you might have life. So consequently, they have greater culpability. They have greater guilt. They have greater responsibility because they had more information to recognize. And this is why he came to them. This is what it says in John chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. It says, he came to his own place, but his own people refused to recognize him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power. And you know the rest of that verse. So this was their unique privilege and that was their unique tragedy as a result of this. But all men and women have some measure of God's truth within them. They have some sense of what is right and what is wrong. Now some people will deny this or say it's not true. But you can actually test whether this is so um, very easily. You know, they may say, well, there's no such thing as right and wrong. There's no such thing as absolutes. There's just, there's just kind of things that we've grown up with. And some people would go as far as to say, um, I'm not under any law. I do exactly what I like. And if you say to them, does that mean that there's no, noth, noth, th there is no such thing as right and wrong? They will say yes. But if you say to them, does that mean you don't mind if I punch you on the nose? They will know that they, it, they don't want to be punched on the nose. And they will know that the, there's no justification for being punched on the nose. And they know that there's something wrong with me punching them on the nose without any kind of provocation. That's to say, human beings have a moral sense. The Jewish people's moral sense was finely tuned as a result of um, the law. Some people would say it still is. It's an interesting thing how many Jewish people become psychiatrists. And many people who become a psychiatrist become psychiatrists because they're trying to understand themselves. Um, there is a tremendous, um, there's a guilt consciousness often, um, almost in the race of Jewish people, that is more sensitized than it is in many other people. Maybe that's a kind of a consequence of all these things that are, are still continuing through. But this is what Paul says, sorry, going back to Romans chapter 2. He says, they show the work of the law written in their hearts. And then he says this, their conscience also bearing witness. Several times in the Bible when it speaks about the conscience, it will use the language of the conscience bearing witness. What the conscience does is it bears witness. It recognizes things. It recognizes that certain things have got an inbuilt authority, that there's a truth in them, that there's a morality here, that although they can't explain it, they, they know it's wrong. And if you say to someone, if someone says to you, well, I don't think it's wrong for me to steal your car or something like that, the chances are he'll do it at night time or while you're not there because he knows there's something wrong. They're just playing games when they say there's no moral sense. It's one of the greatest indications that human beings are quite different to anybody else. Animals are opportunists. They operate by instinct. Uh, you can have the best trained dog in the world, but if you leave a pork chop on your plate and go into the garden, it won't be there when you get back. Um, and it's not because the dog has sinned. It's because it's operating by instinct. But there's something about human beings where they are conscious of right and wrong. And Paul says the works of the Lord, if you like, the shape of the law... The general sense of the law is written in the hearts of men. In many ways, what God gave to the Jewish people was a very um, precise and uniquely applied principles of law. And this is why in the New Covenant, we don't 
try to keep the Ten Commandments. We don't try to keep the law. What we do is we fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. So we're not ticking off the boxes and trying to say, yes, I've, I've done this today, I've done this today, I've done this today. The essence of the law can be reduced to two very simple statements. That you love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, and that you love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul in Galatians says it, uh, it can be summed up in one word. And actually in Greek, one word is thou shalt love. That's all one word in Greek. The whole of the law, the whole work of the law is actually summed up in that. And that, the shape of that is in the hearts of men and women. And people know it's there and when they are about to do something that does not match that law, there's something in them that passes judgment upon their intended behavior. Um, it's interesting the way it works, this kind of judge who works in his court of law. Um, sometimes he will pass judgment about something that's going to happen. Very seldom will he pass judgment about something that is happening. And most often he will pass judgment about something that has happened. It's, um, it, it's an interesting process. Let me give you an illustration of something. And um, There are some passions, some um, desires that God has put into human beings which are so strong that when they are in full flow, it's almost impossible for the human being to hear anything else that's going on at that time. When I was kind of a younger and used to do kind of some hiking, um, there were certain parts that when you went, there was such, um, such a lot of magnetic ore under the ground um, that you couldn't actually use your compass while you were in the middle of it. So what you had to do was before you got onto this particular area, you'd do your sighting, you'd work out, you'd de decide exactly where you're going to go, you'd fix your eye on it, and then you'd put your compass in your pocket. Because from this point on, if you, uh, if you consult your co compass, your compass will actually deceive you. Because the, the strength of the magnetic force that's in the ground underneath will just kind of send the, the compass haywire. <clears throat> and there are certain passions, certain desires that God has put in human beings that when they're in full flow, there's such a strength, such a power, such a force that's operating that the compass will spin. It'll go haywire. And that's why you need to decide before and you need to be sensitive afterwards to know whether you have infringed this moral law. And um, I don't want to be crude, but I'll say it. Some young people may hear this at some time. Um, when you're sitting in the back seat of a car with your girlfriend, that is not the time to decide how far the relationship is going to go. The relationship has to be decided. You have to make the decisions before that. Because once you get into that kind of environment, you will not be able to consult your compass. Um, it, 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 it's, just, it's just some very strong thing that have happened here. But Paul says this, that God has put within every human being um, this shape, this work of the law. And then he says what the conscience does is bear witness to it. I'll get me this part. <clears throat> okay, verse 50, chapter 2, verse 15. He says, they have a law to themselves, or they have a law within themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness between and between themselves, their thoughts excusing or else, accusing or else, excusing themselves. So the conscience is something that works together. It always has to have data to work on. And every human being has some data for the conscience to work on. But for the Jewish people, they had more and better quality data to work on. The Christian has even more and even better quality data to work on. 
So the conscience can actually develop in its sensitivity and it can become more precise and a, um, a more finely developed, a more pr finely de a precise tool or instrument to measure things which are right or wrong. I'm going to have a, I'm going to pause for a minute um, and uh, well, just before I do, I'll just, I'll just say this, that there's, uh, there's one illustration maybe which can help us with this and it, it's the life of John the Baptist. John the Baptist in some ways served as the conscience of Israel. He bore witness to the truth. There's this famous passage in John's Gospel, chapter 1, where John is introduced to us, and it, uh, this is how it introduces him. John chapter 1, verse 6, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. So, John was a gift of God, and your conscience is a gift of God. John actually means a gift of God. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him, that's the light, might believe. Verse 8, he was not that light. John was not the light. It was not the purpose of John to be the one who gave most of the information. John's job was to bear witness to what people already knew. And his operation as a conscience became more effective and more powerful as it received better and more, a higher quality data. So there came a point at which he was able to point to Jesus Christ and say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He now had a, a clearer knowledge, a better knowledge of, of who it was that he was introducing. And he actually said, I didn't know who it was. But God said this, that I should see the Spirit of God coming upon someone and remaining on, and that would be the one. So John bears witness. So the conscience is not directly the Word of God. It's not directly the voice of God, actually, in the heart. It's something which bears witness to that. And it can't operate on its own. It can only operate on the data that it's given. Um, this is what it says here. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of the light. The conscience is something that works in conjunction with something else. And the other thing that it works in conjunction with is information, revelation, truth that God gives. There's a sense in which we only know what our spirit knows. I'm not talking about just information. I'm talking about revelation. The things that are revealed belong to God. Uh, sorry, the things that are secret belong to God. The things that are revealed are ours forever. And truth is not just facts. Truth isn't just statements about something. Um, truth is revelation. It's when something inside you sees the truth of something. You know it's truth. It comes not necessarily as a blinding light. It might come slowly. There's a wonderful book written by um, Elizabeth Elliot on guidance called A Slow and Certain Light, which is a, a lovely title. It doesn't always come immediately, but it does come from God. It must come from God. It must be by revelation. And really, it's only what you know. It's not what you think you know, and it's not what you could produce in an exam if someone is kind of running it. It's what your spirit knows, which is the information that your, um, that your conscience works on. Okay, I'm going to pause. And uh, we can have some questions if you've got some questions.